Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Some guests are so memorable that one interview isn't enough. That's why I'm delighted to welcome poet and translator Martha Collins back to the show. The first time Martha visited, in 2012, we talked about White Papers, a bold collection that addresses America's racist past and the human cost of that dark history. Now, she's here to talk about her new book, Day Unto Day. This lovely series, comprised of short lyrics, began when she decided to write seven lines of verse, just seven, every day for a month. One month led to two, and as the work evolved, she realized the poems were more personal than anything she had published before. The writing also reflected many of her values, justice, spirituality, community, in ways that took her by surprise. Martha will share that journey with us. She will also talk about Black Stars, a collection she co-translated with the Vietnamese poet No Tu Lop. Those poems, like her own, are powerful, beautiful, essential. They also hint at the affinities she and Lop share. I know you will love Martha's insights as much as I do. Martha, Welcome back. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to be here again. I'll begin just by reading two sections of the last of the six sequences that make up this book, uh, two seven-line sections. This is the January 2009 poem, and it's called Grade In. One. Snow fallen, another going gone, new come in, open the door. Each night I grow young, my friends are well again, my life is all before me. Each morning I close a door, another door. Two. Cloud on cloud, gray on gray, snow fallen on snow, tree on tree on unleafed tree. Only a river silvered with thin ice and a slash of gold in the late gray sky. Mm. Those sections are beautiful. And when I read them the first time, I had no idea that they were part of a, a manuscript that had evolved from a daily practice. Yes. Tell us about the daily practice, and then we'll talk a little bit about how that daily exercise turned into this series. Okay, uh, this began uh, in October 2004. I had just finished a book-length poem and didn't really know how to write a short poem anymore mm -hmm. and somehow decided that what I would do would be to write seven lines a day for each day of October 2004. Mm -hmm. And um, I liked doing that so much the next year I decided to do it again. I still didn't know how to write a short poem. And no sooner had I decided to do it again in 2005 than I decided that I was going to do this once a year for one month until I had gotten through all 12 months, which mm. means that this project will be finished in 2015. Mm. So meanwhile, six, the first six of these 12 poems have been published. I've written five more. I have one to go. I. It was a practice, kind of a spiritual practice. I thought of the poetry of meditation, mm -hmm. uh, the Christian practice, the Buddhist mm -hmm. practice. My rule was I had to write every day. I couldn't skip a day. And I couldn't write ahead, although I would write little tiny notes at the top of my notebook that might go into the next day. And so when I got to the second day, I would look back at the first day and probably work on it a bit, but then move on to the second. Mm -hmm. I had some ideas of what I would be doing each month. I knew what season I was in. I knew what the holidays were. The first poem, I was, my mother had recently died and my husband had the first of a couple of serious surgeries, but I didn't know what was going to come up. Mm -hmm. And I found that the more I wrote, the more the news of the world found its way into the poem. So it's a mix of the personal and the impersonal mm -hmm. with some kind of links between each section. Mm -hmm. Why seven lines? Um, half a sonnet is what I was thinking. 
uh, mm. halfway in my head. I, I recently talked to Marilyn Hacker, who has written a lot of tankas, which is a Japanese form that has seven lines, and she said, oh, you wrote tankas. And mm. I said, well, <laughs> no, I wasn't thinking tankas exactly. But, but I like the fact that seven lines d is not even, it's odd. Mm -hmm. So you can't have little neat couplets. Um, and I liked the irresolution of seven lines mm -hmm. if you're mm -hmm. thinking about sonnets. Uh, they don't usually divide in half, but it mm -hmm. was a kind of way of pushing me on to the next. Mm -hmm. You said that the practice was almost meditative mm -hmm. in some ways. When you were writing these poems, did you write them differently than you would a, a longer poem? Oh, good question. Um, the truth is, I tend to write very little at a time anyway. Mm -hmm. So I might write down three lines in a day and stop instead mm -hmm. of trying to push my way mm -hmm. to the end of a long, longer poem. Uh, or I might write down seven lines. So in some ways, it sort of reflects the fact that I'm one of those writers who writes very little. Mm -hmm. um, I had a student once who was a sculptor who talked about the difference between sculptors who start with a block of stone and carve it down and those who mm -hmm. start with clay and mm -hmm. build it up. Mm -hmm. And I'm a clay person. So mm -hmm. this was kind of familiar. Mm -hmm. You said that you reached a point where you thought, oh, I don't know how to write short poems anymore. Yeah. And that startled me because I thought, she's such a wonderful poet. How could she forget well, that? After I had written Blue Front, which is a book-length poem, I had mm -hmm. written The White Papers, which I talked with mm -hmm. you about before, mm -hmm. which are separate mm -hmm. poems, but they don't have titles, they have numbers. They're all dealing with race, particular, mm -hmm. particularly whiteness. Mm -hmm. So they're related. So as I was writing that book, I wasn't sort of making up brand new poems. Mm -hmm. And it's the making up a brand new poem that I have pretty much forgotten how to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's sort of like a fiction writer who starts out writing short stories and mm -hmm. then discovers the novel and mm -hmm. never or rarely looks back. I've written mm -hmm. some medium-sized poems, mm -hmm. uh, short poems, but mm -hmm. not very many in the last, I would say, mm -hmm. 15 years. Well, as you said, some short story writers discover the novel yeah. and never look back, but you have the amazing ability to write the equivalent of short stories and novels. Well, so what are these, these six poems in this book? They're not, they're not novels for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole book isn't really a novel, but maybe each one of them is a kind of novella, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the book I've just finished, which is kind of the third book in a trilogy that started with the book-length poem Blue Front and moved to White Papers, has individual poems in it, and they actually mm -hmm. have titles. Mm -hmm. But they're very hard to take out of context mm -hmm. because they, they connect to one another. So I guess I could say that, like some novelists slash short story writers, I have written, and these are the same, they're mm -hmm. linked poems, mm -hmm. sort of separate, but linked to others. Mm -hmm. White Papers is a powerful book. It's expansive, it's edgy. It's the perfect vehicle for the subject matter. And day into day is quieter. Yes. It's more intimate. Yes. Yes. And yet there's still an expansiveness there. Do you think that reflects the fact that you were bringing together all of these different threads of your life? or? Were the threads just coming to the surface? I think that is probably what I love about the expansive form, is mm -hmm. that I can bring the threads together. Mm -hmm. And um, I certainly did that in a different way in white papers. There are mm -hmm. some poems that are historical, that don't have me in them at all. There's some mm -hmm. about my childhood. Um, and the little sections of this book are sometimes very personal. Sometimes they're observational, the seasons make their way, of course, into poems mm -hmm. that are written over a month, uh, and they're increasingly uh, reflecting the world around me. So, mm -hmm. so to, and they're also partly because I was thinking of the poetry of meditation, partly because when I began, my mother had just died, my husband mm -hmm. was ill, mm -hmm. I was thinking about mortality. 
I was using for the first time probably in poetry the word soul mm -hmm. and so yeah. there's a spirituality to these poems mm -hmm. which I don't think appears much in my earlier work maybe mm -hmm. some very early work but not much mm -hmm. One of the things I love about the book is that it's almost the literary equivalent of attending a mass oh. where there are various elements that are meaningful, enjoyable, powerful as a separate part of the event. And then you look at the whole and you get a very different feeling. Day into day is very much like that. But it's also the kind of thing that you can dip into and just take a little bit where it's almost like you're connecting with another soul and then you bring that back into your own life. Oh, thank you. That's a lovely statement. And, and um, I love the equation with, with the mass. Uh, one of the things I did um, in July, I was thinking about our country and it becomes very political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In December, of course, because I come from a Christian background and mm -hmm. embrace that in an unconventional way, mm -hmm. I was thinking about Christmas. In April, I was thinking about Easter. And uh, I actually used the liturgical readings for those months. Uh, mm -hmm. when I came upon those days. Mm -hmm. You have this wonderful ability to translate experience into poetry, and you seem to translate various experiences or concerns into different kinds of poetry depending upon what is needed. You also translate other people's work do you see any similarities or connections between the two? Yes, I do. Uh, in fact, I mean, it's been said before, but all poetry is translation. Mm -hmm. um, but more specifically, after I began translating primarily, well, I've translated a lot of things, but lately it's been co-translations from the Vietnamese. Um, that is when I began looking into history and using documentary material mm. um, in a couple of ways. One thing, my mother was dying and I was mm. writing down what mm -hmm. she was saying and translating mm. that into poetry. Mm -hmm. But when I wrote Blue Front and White Papers, I did a lot of research. Blue Front is about a lynching that my father witnessed mm -hmm. and I had a lot of newspaper stuff. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that the process of translating newspaper accounts or other mm -hmm. documentary other documentary material into poetry was very much like translating a Vietnamese poem mm -hmm. into English. And I honestly don't know whether I would have been able to do that or would have thought to do that quite mm -hmm. so much if I hadn't done the translation from another language. Mm -hmm. When people ask me how translation has affected my own work, that's the primary thing that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. There may be other things. This may be a good place for us to segue into Black Stars. Would you read a poem from that book? I will. Um, uh, this is uh, Black Stars. It's a, uh, our poems by Nyo Chu Lap, uh, which he and I translated together over a period of six years, I believe. And what I'm going to read is the title poem. Black Stars. Many months have passed drenched in sweat, but I have returned to boldly place on the table two hands, two five-pointed stars. Stories of war and shipwreck don't entice me. Mm. When I close my eyes, two stars fly into the darkness. To fly is to see how lofty the sky is, how wide the sea. There in the village, a rooster is crowing. In the scent of burning rice fields, dew is sparkling. Over there is my mother, there my country. On guns and plows, millions of diligent stars are flying in silence. Black stars, black stars. Mm. One life might have drifted away, but one has returned. When I open my eyes, two stars alight before me, pulsing, breathing. Mm. That book is gorgeous, mm -hmm. and it's easy to notice the beauty of the language and the imagery. 
and then realize after, say, the second reading that, oh, so much of this book really is almost a form of activism. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you are a lifelong yes. activist. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how things have changed for you over time. Okay. Um, my activism, I suppose, starts uh, a number of things coming together, but a primary one was the Vietnam War, which I protested. Mm -hmm. uh, I had not written a lot of poetry. I tried to write poems about that war. They were terrible. Mm -hmm. um, but the activism continued on the one hand, the poetry on the other. Sometimes they talked to each other. Uh, and then I discovered that my father had witnessed a lynching when mm -hmm. he was five years old. Mm -hmm. And then race became a really central factor in my own work. That happened just a little bit after I had discovered Vietnamese poetry and begun to translate it. And it was kind of amazing to discover, first of all, how much of Vietnam I had missed, mm -hmm. even though I had read a lot of history, I'd read mm -hmm. about the war, but I had not experienced the emotions of a Vietnamese person until I read mm -hmm. the poems. Mm -hmm. So it was very meaningful to me, but the other thing that happened was I realized that, oh my goodness, there is a lot of this poetry out there, and even though I don't know the language, mm -hmm. I did take a year of Vietnamese at Harvard, so I have some, uh, I, could translate these poems and in a way it was an act of social activism or let mm -hmm. me say reconciliation. This mm -hmm. was my gift to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, probably more meaningful in, in a more lasting way than my single body at a demonstration in the mm -hmm. 19, early 1970s. Mm -hmm. Um, Lop was born in 1962, and his family was moved away from Hanoi to the countryside. So mm -hmm. he experienced the war as a child. Mm -hmm. And you hear echoes of that in a number of the poems. There are other poems that also sort of embed the war in a poem that can be about something else altogether. Mm -hmm. And. Um, Oh goodness, I didn't know this was an influence. I'm not sure it is. But that's what Day on Today does as well. That, mm -hmm. as I said, gradually I found myself moving toward reflecting the news of the world, not mm -hmm. just the news of me or the news of the seasons. Mm -hmm. So Lop and I share that. Mm -hmm. The word reconciliation jumped out at me a moment ago because that seems to be such an important part of so many of your activities, certainly as a poet and as a translator, but also even the fact that you have reconnected with a spiritual community. Yeah, that's, that's a reconciliation too. Mm -hmm. uh, your repeating my word to me reminds me of those, that line and a half by William Carlos Williams uh, about poetry, through metaphor to reconcile the people and the stones. Mm -hmm. So it's self mm -hmm. and world mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned when we were talking earlier that the Joiner Center has given you a sense of yes. community yes. and church has also given yes. you a sense of community. Do you see similarities oh, yes, between absolutely. the two? The Joiner Center is now called the Joiner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences. Mm. I began teaching workshops there in the early 1990s, after which I went to Vietnam with Fred mm -hmm. Marchand. Mm -hmm. um, before that, the Joiner Center Summer Workshop had been primarily for veterans. The Joiner Center, now Institute, was formed by 1980s veterans who, of course, were Vietnam mm -hmm. vets. Mm -hmm. And um, I've gone there every summer since 1993 and been connected in other ways, and it's been a very, very important community to me. Mm -hmm. The church that I attend is a very radical one. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very active during the Vietnam War. They were active in the sanctuary movement and housed a woman uh, who was, had fled El Salvador. We now have a very active racial justice group. Mm -hmm. So both of these communities for me are social activism <laughs> communities. Mm -hmm. The Joiner Center uh, connects literature as well. My church, uh, one of the things I like about it is that it's a community that is not particularly literary, although I have increasingly read my poems there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
This is old Cambridge Baptist Church, if anyone is interested. If someone were to ask you, well, what's the value of, of being part of, of a community? Do we really have to connect with others in this digital age? What would you say? I would say we'd better. If mm -hmm. we don't, I think our digital age society with its with the politics that we see, with the wars that we see, with the conflicts we see, with the violence we see, is really lost. Mm. It's hard to feel hostility towards someone who is in your community whom you sit beside. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say they when they are beside you. They become we. And mm -hmm. I, I think the main reason I go to church is for hope. Mm -hmm. And part of that hope is community. And mm -hmm. I think this is particularly important for a poet because the activity of writing poems is a very lonely one. And mm. I do not denigrate that. If someone is capable of writing poems in near isolation and that person is Emily Dickinson, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> who wouldn't mm -hmm. want to do that? But uh, for myself, the community really matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you that hope is essential and it's one of the things that poetry gives people yes, yes. sometimes in a very direct way sometimes almost slant yes when you think about the work you've done say in the past couple of years what gives you hope oh uh the work inside and outside poetry mm -hmm. oh in writing mm -hmm. oh that's a very good question um the, the new book that's coming out is, as I say, a kind of third book uh, in a trilogy. Um, and it, like the, the first and the second, uh, goes back into history. And mm. um, it explores that history. It starts at the 1904 World's Fair, which my mother attended because her mother took her there in her belly. She was pregnant. Mm. And what I discovered about that fair uh, is not only that it was a celebration of progress, but, but also that they had human exhibits mm -hmm. um, who had been brought from around the world, 3,000 of them, including mm -hmm. an African pygmy I got particularly interested in who ended up in the Bronx Zoo, which was founded by a man who was a conservationist, but who also wrote a pretty appalling book called The Passing of the Great Race, which was published in 1916, which led to some pretty horrendous legislation in the mm. 1920s, and which led Adolf Hitler to say to Madison Grant, this author and founder of the, of the Bronx Zoo, your book is my Bible. Ooh. Now, that history, I think, is enormously important for us. Mm -hmm. Because I think as Americans, we think, um, I heard one of the candidates in the last election say the United States is the best country in the history of the world. And that mm. kind of arrogance, I think, gets us in a lot of trouble. And mm. for me to explore in those three books something about our history and to, to learn things I did not know mm -hmm. has been particularly moving and important. Mm -hmm. The Day on Today poems look a little more at recent history at recent happenings. Mm -hmm. And that's Im been important to me too. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of that seems to me to be really necessary if we're going to get our act together in this world. Mm -hmm. And that gives you hope? Uh, sure. I mean, to be part of that process, I mean, who knows how things come out. There, mm -hmm. I think intellectually mm -hmm. I may be somewhat pessimistic, but um, to be part of a community, to be translating with a person from a country that we were at war with once, to be writing about these subjects, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is to be part of a larger thing, something much larger than myself. Yes. And maybe someday it'll be large enough. Beautiful. Beautifully said. And believe it or not, we are almost out of time. So would you read a few more sections? I will read two sections almost at the end of the poem that I began with. Uh, the first one starts with Vietnam, and then it moves to Gaza. Remember, this is December 2009. Mm -hmm. The siege of Gaza was going on all month. This, I did not expect this to be such a large part of the poem, but the mm. figures kept going up. Um, 
And this is the end of that. So two sections once again. In Vietnam, new year of the water buffalo, steady, slow, welcomed with peach blossoms, fruits, red wine. In Gaza, year of the new war, now ended, but no room to bury the dead, no place for the living to buy food, water, any. 30. For the woman who cooks on a fire of sticks, her bag of clothes on a tree. For those going home to water their trees, lemon and almond and olive and for those trees. Mm. Mm. Your words give me hope because they make me feel much more human, much more compassionate. And that's where change starts. Yes, it is. And that's what poetry is for. Exactly. Anything that you would like to say in the last few minutes, last few moments? <laughs> <laughs> Just thank you so much for having me back, Elizabeth. I love talking to you. I always learn something myself, and I have this time, too. Oh, well, thank you for your words and your wisdom, Martha. It's protected. And the music I listen to. Protected. What about how I wear my hair? And the things I say and write? The Constitution protects your rights. It isn't an old, fading piece of paper. It's a living document. The Constitution says there are three branches of government. So we're kind of like the fourth branch of government. We are the future of America. Find out how you can become part of Constitution Day. For me. For all. For real. Go to aclu.org slash Constitution Day. Hi, I'm Amy Harper. Please join us next time, Absolutely Yoga, only on HCAM-TV.